Good evening. Thank you for joining us today for NWHM Presents, a time for conversation, camaraderie, and discovering more about the women who have helped shape our world that have been largely underrepresented in our historical narrative. My name is Emma Rothberg, and I am the Associate Educator of Digital Learning and Innovation at the National Women's History Museum. For those of you who are with us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who have attended an NWHM program before, welcome back and thank you for your continued support. The National Women's History Museum exists to preserve, illuminate, and share the powerful history of women in America, highlighting both the past and present as a contemporary virtual history museum. NWHM seeks to ensure that women's history is available and accessible to learners of all ages across the globe and is working to bring a visionary new model of partnership to our nation's cultural institutions. In that spirit, the work of today's guest centers the importance of teaching women's history, particularly women's sports history. Before we begin, please allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel in the days following the event. Today's guests are available to answer your questions, so please use the Q&A feature on the tool ribbon to ask any questions that you may have regarding the presentation. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation, but we will answer them at the end. Thank you to those of you who submitted your questions in advance as well. You are also welcome to use the chat feature if you have any comments throughout the program. Let me start today's program by asking just a few questions. Who was the first female athlete you admired? Were male and female athletes treated differently in your high school? Is there a natural limit to women's athletic ability? How has Title IX opened up opportunities for women athletes? Every semester since 1996, Bonnie Morris has encouraged students to confront questions like these in one of the most provocative college courses in America, Athletics and Gender, A History of Women's Sports. What's the Score, Morris's energetic teaching memoir, is a peek inside that class and features a decades-long dialogue with student athletes about the greater opportunities for women on the playing field, as coaches, and in sports media. From corsets to segregated schoolyards to the WNBA, we find women athletes the world over conquering unique barriers to success. What's the Score is not only an insider's look at sports education, but also an engaging guide to turning points in women's sports history that everyone should know. I'm joined today by two very special guests, Dr. Bonnie J. Morris, author of What's the Score? 25 Years of Teaching Women's Sports History, published in June 2022, and Elizabeth Dowling McQuitter, who will guide this evening's conversation. Make sure that everyone can see our lovely participants. Elizabeth Liz Galloway McQuitter is president of Legends of the Ball, Inc., a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the historic and social relevance of the Women's Basketball League to inspire future generations to break through barriers, realize their potential, and become leaders for positive change. Born in Rocktail, Texas, McQuitter began playing in the neighborhood with her big brother and other neighborhood kids. After schools were integrated, she started playing in junior high in the eighth grade, and by her freshman year was on varsity. She was on two state teams, one which finished runner-up in her junior year and was named All-State that year. That was the year of Title IX. Liz went on to play basketball at Temple Junior College, where she won the NJCAA National Championship and the University of Nevada, Nevada Las Vegas. Liz was then invited to try out for a women's basketball league team. She made the squad, became a starter, and made history playing in the first women's professional basketball game in the United States. After the WBL folded, Liz moved back to Texas, where she served as an educator and coach. In 2018, Liz and 11 other former WLB players formed Legends of the Ball, Inc. As president, Liz has made it her mission to bring this very important league out of the shadows and tell the compelling story of pioneers of Title IX, the Olympics, and the WBL, among others, and showcase their contributions to this game. We are grateful to have Liz to guide our conversation tonight. It is also my pleasure to introduce our special guest this evening, Bonnie J. Morris. Dr. Morris earned her PhD in women's history from Binghamton University and taught at both George Washington University and Georgetown for almost 25 years, becoming Professor Emeritus and Professor of the Year at GW and Vicennial Medalist at Georgetown. In 2017, she joined the history faculty at the University of California, Berkeley, earning a nomination for its Excellence in Teaching Prize. A nationally recognized authority on women's music movement and women's sports history, Dr. Morris is the author of 19 books including Women's History for Beginners, The Disappearing L, 
the feminist revolution and the new women's sports retrospective, What's the Score? She is also an active and engaged member of the National Women's History Museum's Scholar, Scholars Advisory Council. We are grateful to have Bonnie with us to talk to, today to talk about the importance of teaching women's sports history. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Bonnie Morris and Liz Galloway McClitter. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. I just want to start off by saying uh, I'm so glad to be part of this collaborating uh, with you, and I'm so glad to be talking about this on this milestone day of this milestone year of Title IX's 50th anniversary. As um, my generation and I were the ones who first walked through that door, I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear other perspectives about where we are right now. This book, um, What's the Score, caught me right off the bat uh, talking about, uh, remember when you played your first games. And I can remember in my neighborhood playing so those games, I was just screaming, yes, we played that, we played that game. And so I also love a good timeline. So Bonnie, when you started off with the timeline, I think that is one of the main ways to present history and get it across to others. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you though, when we have so many questions, I know we'll never get to them, but what was the impulse behind creating your first women's history sports class? Thank you so much. And uh, hello, everybody. And Elizabeth, I just have so much respect. It's an honor. Uh, happy uh, Title IX golden anniversary, everybody out there. It's a very special day. And I appreciate uh, folks have lots of choices in programming today. So thanks for being here. Um, yes, I've been teaching this class uh, since 1996. And there were several reasons I started it. I had already been teaching uh, women's history at the college level for over 10 years. Um, and I had uh, been a big fan of women's sports. I was sort of disgusted that I was often the only women's studies faculty uh, sitting in the bleachers at women's games. I was uh, already an advocate about um, getting more attendance, publicity, visibility, promotion uh, for women athletes. Um, and uh, essentially one of the things that happened was while I was teaching at George Washington University, there was a big campus-wide discussion about violence uh, toward women committed by athletes. And was there something inherently disrespectful of women in sports? How come we seem to see that in the headlines? Was that unfair? How did uh, women athletes juxtapose uh, playing sometimes in front of empty bleachers versus uh, the stereotyping about their ability and other things in our culture. And we just didn't have a forum for talking about all of these issues in one space. And I went to my uh, program director and said, I'd be delighted to design and teach a class that's a scholarly but safe space to really talk about what are the challenges for both men and women in uh, stereotypes about sports and particularly the history of women's struggle to be celebrated as athletes. Um, and I planned out a curriculum that just covered about everything, attitudes about the body, uh, fragility versus slavery in what we expect from female strength and muscularity, gym culture, uh, women taking on men's roles in wartime, including the All-American Girls uh, Baseball League, uh, food and nutrition and diet culture, homophobia, coach abuse, um, yeah. the way that wages are, you know, still unfair at every level. And uh, the class initially attracted about, oh, I'd say 50% uh, division one athletes and 50% women's studies majors. And then that rapidly changed. And suddenly I had uh, students who were interested in health and wellness, uh, sports journalism, uh, sports as a business, um, law, uh, and uh, I was invited to teach the class at the Crosstown Rival at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. So soon I had uh, students uh, who were the starting five on both the uh, teams uh, who would play against each other, all enrolled in my class on two different campuses. And then uh, the rest is history. The, the course was uh, solicited for a semester at sea from my alma mater, American University, and then when I came out to Berkeley, I also have taught it at St. Mary's College uh, and Santa Clara University. Um, the timeline at the beginning of the book 
is to ground everybody in how far women have come and who are some of the unsung leaders of all backgrounds. And I wanted to both uh, give every reader tools to join the conversation and also a peek into how a semester runs. You know, you're basically getting a ringside seat to a basic semester of the class in, in exactly the way I teach it. Uh, so anybody who's buying the book now is going to get a peek at what the midterm exam answers <laughs> are. And that's fine by me. The fall class is already almost sold out at Berkeley, but bring it on. I noticed that at the end uh, that with the wrap up. So I was thinking the same thing. Um, I, not to put you on the spot with the timeline, but the thing with timelines, it's like it seems like they, they inevitably it sometimes are omissive, uh, not by intent and and just always changing. And uh, it's a shameless plug on my part, but one of the things that we as, as members of the WBL always notice is that we always seem to get left out of that timeline. I'm and really sorry. No, no, no. I just, this is a great opportunity. That's what we are doing, correcting it. And I wanted to know, had, had you heard of the WBL before and the women of we, what we call the triad, the AIAW and the WBL, the first league, and then those leagues in between there? Had you? Yes, I have. Yes, ma'am. And uh, my apologies again. I, I had to keep it down to 100 entries. Um, uh, one of my greatest uh, allies and uh, guest uh, visitor in my uh, classroom often is Mariah Burton Nelson, who played for the California Dream in yes. the 70s. Um, and uh, I used her book for years, The Stronger Women Get, The More Men Love Football. Um, I very love that. The, the <laughs> AIAW, certainly. And I think one of the, the, the points that I make most uh, consistently in class is you know, when you had a separate women's division before women came into the NCAA, there was far less funding and visibility, but there was a certain amount of control. You had women coaching yes. women and women as athletic directors. You had a separate women's gym that was usually substandard, but you had women in those offices employed in charge of the women's game. And just as what happened when, you know, Jackie Robinson integrated the majors, uh, you had at that point black talent uh, flocking into white control and the gradual collapse of the old quote Negro leagues. Same with uh, independent, you know, women's play. You come into the NCAA and you gain the spotlight and the recording and the promotion in in college play. But many women lost their jobs and are still uh, uh, justly bitter about the passing of control of women's college ball in, into primarily, but not completely, male control. So if I don't have the entry in the timeline, I do have the wrap down uh, in the classroom yes, at the right time. Yes, you do. And I'd just like to throw in that Muffet McGraw, but to, to just speak on both those points, Muffet McGraw played for the California Dreams. And we know that after she left Notre Dame, while she was there and after she left Notre Dame, she has taken upon herself along with Tara to really push for the, those women to, to coach women's sports. So kudos and, to her. And also the women of the AIAW, uh, many of whom we played for, um, though there were things lacking, they certainly took looked at it as their baby, as their, mm -hmm. their pride and joy, and they did everything to make that successful. Uh, there is a broad approach in your book, and I, I love it because I, I love history. I love the thoroughness of it. And is there any one area though that you teach that's the most popular with your students? And, and just a second part of that, is there uh, the popularity based on, you, you mentioned the women's studies kids and the, and the athletes, does it go along those lines as well? No, it's totally changed. Those are both terrific questions. I really appreciate uh, your approach. Um, uh, one of the things that's happened now, I'm happy to report that to a large degree, um, uh, despite all the pushback we are seeing nationally, mm -hmm. uh, diversification in the humanities is appreciated and treated as normal, at least where I've taught. So uh, now you can get credit as a diversity uh, option to take my class. I have a lot of students enroll who are engineering majors from China and non-athletes and from all over the world. Um, it is very normal to take a class like mine uh, as part of your broader electives. 
Um, I have actually a minority of athletes now, and I have more students who are coming in, uh, just as they'll tell me, there's no class like this where they're from, whether it's Kuwait or Korea or you know Belarus. Um, many of the students, because they're international, are just catching up with uh, American history and in particular American slang. And one of the things they love is where I point out how much our language is informed by the assumption everyone in America plays sports. You know, you're on the ball, you're a Monday morning, you know, quarterback, uh, you're still on the, you know, whatever yard line. Um, ah, you know, there was a full court press. I had to explain all this language to my mom because it was used during uh, the uh, election uh, as a means to describe, you know, how candidates were moving forward. Uh, so they love to talk about language, and I love to talk about how women are left out of sports literacy when they're not introduced to those conversations early on. Yes. I think the students I have at Berkeley who are very tuned in to representation are very moved by the uh, material on Native American athletics. Um, uh, we used the film Playing for the World about the best women's basketball team in the country in 1905, which was the Fort Shaw Indian School girls basketball team. Uh, we look at the internment of Japanese Americans and the limited sports that were available to women in those camps, although Little League was made available to young men to keep them focused and so forth. Uh, they appreciate that very much. They're very shocked by the film uh, Training Rules that I use, Dee Mossbacker's excellent film about homophobia in coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also uh, disturbed by, in a good way, the, the film I use called um, In Whose Honor, which looks at Indian mascots uh, before the Washington national team changed its name. So there, the class is consistently intersectional with uh, racism and sexism and homophobia. And um, I would say one of the most difficult conversations for the women in the classroom is when we really get into talking about fat shaming in our culture and who had an unpleasant experience in PE because they were made to feel they had the wrong kind of body, how clothes um, uh, reinforce those feelings. If you're not a particular kind of sexy you're not gonna attract audiences and the way that some teams even sexualize uniforms to bring in a male audience. That's very personal to a lot of athletes. Uh, and uh, often I get more engaged emails that are you know, private, which is a terrific um, tool at my disposal. Thank you for those questions. Yeah. You know, we wore the short shorts um, back when we played. So it was kind of the norm. But uh, I do think I know when we were at the hustle, they, what, there was a certain sexualized part to that, and and of course, going back to the days of PE, we had to. I noticed the the PE uniform you showed in the book, and I can remember my little PE jumpsuit onesie, you mm -hmm. know, that we participated in. But um, with all the interest in Title IX, I mean, it's been building that this this anniversary, 50th year anniversary. Has there been an uptick? an interest in taking your class? Uh, yes, thank you. I work or my interest tail off in Title IX have... and just the history of it overall. Yeah, I, I worked very hard to have the book come out right before the Title IX anniversary. I really wanted the book to be a teaching tool. There's also a full Title IX timeline in a later chapter. I, my syllabi are in the back of the book. I really wanted something that I could just hand to people and say, unfamiliar with Title IX, here but also uh, for, uh, men in particular who teach uh, history or who are, uh, let's say at a lot of private schools, uh, male coaches are also the American history teacher and so on. I wanted everyone to have a book that could be used uh, to guide them. How do you teach this material? What do students think? What are some approaches? Um, what's humorous about all of our disagreements and what's what'll stay with a class if you introduce certain stories. So um, definitely uh, I have interest in the way Title IX has been used for sexual harassment claims and um, following up on where a campus environment does not feel um, comfortable. 
Um, there are a lot of guys uh, who enroll in the class. It's more than 50-50 now, which is, I feel, a great compliment. Mm -hmm. They're uh, far more respectful uh, to these conversations um, than in the mid to late 90s when I first started out, where I often had male students say very casually, women's sports just aren't exciting, they're not interesting, or they would say very defensively, Title IX is taking away opportunities from men. It's just a reverse discrimination. And women would certainly talk back, but it, it created an uncomfortable uh, feeling for sure. And um, uh, once in a while, I would even have a, a guy who would write a really hostile uh, essay on his midterm. Oh, really? And I would be amazed by how uh, someone would pay college tuition just to be insulting uh, to the professor, not not a practice I took on in my day, but uh, for now, I have tons of students who are, first of all, the sons of single moms, mm -hmm. and they know the struggle. They know the language of wage discrimination. They are respectful. I had at Georgetown almost the entire football team, beautiful dudes, uh, who one guy took the class and then he told his friend, hey, she's okay. Then I had five, then I had seven, then I had 11. Then I had to go to the coach and say, you can't enroll the whole team. This The section's limited to 20 people, but um, <laughs> they loved it. And I was an honorary coach and sat on the bench and got to meet the parents. And it was a, a beautiful thing. But even though I am welcoming and I can see the results, there's a little twinge in the heart when I know from emails, some of my top male students are graduating into six figure playing positions and the best women are struggling. They're struggling. And uh, I mean, economically, not in terms of achievement. Uh, we don't have that kind of wage equity uh, professionally. And that's one of the reasons we see Brittany Griner languishing overseas. I feel called to say her name today. Mm -hmm. let's let's talk about how when, when we're talking about the, the history of sports how how has that history changed in your class and how do you talk about that those changes i as a as a member of uh, uh, as a original trailblazer of title nine i certainly can speak to the changes and um how do you view the changes um in just say the last 50 years. We could talk about the history of sports from 1892 when women first started playing, but if, in respect to the last 50 years, how do you see the changes? Are there seminal moments, seminal mm -hmm. um, events, characters that you feel have really impacted the history over these past 50 years? Yeah, sure, you bet. Of course, I, um, I, I give credit to uh, Billie Jean King, um, but I, um, I, I would go back earlier with with um, uh, Wilma Rudolph and really, you know, uh, the Tennessee Tiger Bells in establishing women's track as an Olympic mm -hmm. uh, sport for American women. Um, uh, what I teach in the classroom is that, of course, Title IX did not begin as a sports law. It began as an and education course, yeah. amendment and mm -hmm. was meant to kick open the door where women weren't even allowed to, you know, attend Princeton or were kept at a, you know, quota at Harvard and Yale, and uh, if allowed at certain universities, were not permitted in the engineering major. I love to tell the story of how uh, Georgetown did not have a women's bathroom in the science building, because when women were admitted, there was no expectation they would be taking STEM. That has changed hugely. Um, in terms of uh, casual attitudes, you don't belong here. Uh, what's helped is women running for office, um, actually having to go to the men in con Congress and saying women would also like to use the congressional swimming pool. And initially the men of Congress said, well, you'll just have to come and work out at 6 a.m. because we swim naked. I mean, that kind of low level rudeness, uh, challenging, do you belong here? Many women across every level of participation fought mini battles. Um, can you, I'm, I'm sorry, did, Bonnie, I don't mean to inter interrupt, but can you, be specific to you mentioned of course we know about billy jean king and the nine mm -hmm. do you break it down by those sports and those seminal moments and those key individuals 
let it let's take tennis let's take mm -hmm. women's basketball let's take women's track and field uh obviously with uh Wyoming, Wyoming Atias, yes. who I had the privilege, mm -hmm. privilege of meeting recently, and Wilma Rudolph, as you mentioned, and mm -hmm. um, the softball. Do you break down those by the sports and the two sport. of the players? Uh, sport by sport. Um, I make all of that available in, you know, reading assignments. I use a wonderful book called Coming on Strong by Susan Kahn, which is just fantastic. Uh, I also use a book called Female Gladiators um, by Sarah Fields, which looks at the biggest cases in Title IX. You know, uh, can women do wrestling? Can guys do field hockey? Uh, who says no? Um, I give uh, an overview of how uh, the rules in basketball changed going from, you know, half court to full court and when were women, you know, allowed to do an outside shot. Um, I certainly look at the growth of women's soccer and how in the United States uh, that it actually got sort of uh, misconstrued as a girls sport because it, it became popular very late after other sports were uh, sort of established as masculine. And it became uh, unfairly tagged as kind of a white girl sport because it grew where there was available green space in the affluent suburbs. Uh, urban space is already being designated for so many other men's sports altogether. Uh, in those ways, I approach Title IX through both, you know, social justice, uh, specific um, individuals who worked on the law like Edith Green, Birch By, Patsy Mink. Um, I look at where girls challenged uh, their right to play, where uh, schools um, fought back by saying, um, girls aren't interested or we have cheerleading. Um, I look regionally at how obviously you're not going to have uh, a whole lot of girls pushing to add ice hockey in rural New Mexico, but you might very well in Maine and New Hampshire. So it depends on the part of the country where you have the, uh, the girls denied a team for the most popular event. Uh, my personal experience, mm, boy, uh, as my PE teacher who is watching knows, uh, I was a lousy athlete, but a great historian. And uh, I knew my rights. I just was uh, pretty clumsy. And when I moved to a new school in Maryland, when I was 13, I walked into the principal's office with a copy of Title IX saying, I get to play soccer even if I'm bad at it. And that's what the law uh, says. And I tell that story because it, it, the point is, if you let me play, I might get better. Uh, and the expectation that, you know, from the very beginning, all women should be held to the standard of, you know, elite Olympic stars. And if you can't do that many pull-ups, aha, see, you're not as good as a guy. That's not fair. Um, what we know is women have been denied facilities, training, wages, uh, uniforms, space, playing time, uh, the games shown on TV all along and every single one of those things had to be contested. We also know women are easily breaking records set by men not long ago because all of us are evolving as people and athletes. We have better shoes, better food, x-rays. You just had knee surgery. We have access <laughs> to all the tools that would let us you know, easily defeat records sent earlier. So the idea a woman will never you know, run this, you know, kind of a mile, just wait. And the question is whether those tools are extended to girls as well as boys. Um, I certainly knew what it meant to be a student athlete uh, 50 years ago in high school when Title IX came along and was blessed that girls basketball was big in Texas, but everybody didn't experience that. What do you feel uh, female athletes feel, feel like it, it, what it is to be an, a female athlete today? What do, you, what do you glean from that, from your mm -hmm. students who mm -hmm. are uh, these, these division one or major student athletes? Do these, they these talk about that? Such great questions. I just have to praise you to the skies because um, sometimes I'm asked, stuff. Here's a sports metaphor from out of left field. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> um, the uh, students I have now are very grounded. Uh, they have a different kind of problem, which is stress. There's a lot of pressure now to be on a traveling team at five and, you know, uh, specialized by the time you're out of kindergarten. 
Um, there's um, uh, a lot of uh, pressure to be a winner. That's very much an aspect of American culture, but it's also because uh, parents understand you can get an athletic scholarship to college. There are some dads who visualize their daughter's gonna have a shoe named after her and they begin uh, you know, sending pictures of her to scouts when she's in third grade. So uh, students will talk very candidly about the pressure they experience, but that they're very grateful for their soccer moms or their coaches or, or having learned time management you know, while young. Um, the, the interesting problem is you can still succeed as an athlete, but quote, fail as a woman. In other words, have your appearance picked on or ask, you know, when are you going to get married? Or uh, very well intending, loving relatives saying, it's so great you won those medals, but don't get, you know, biceps that are so big you can't wear this little blouse that I'm sending you. That mm -hmm. has been reported to me the entire 25 years. For 25 years, my best female athletes will say, my family's proud of me. They, the older relatives don't want me to have big muscles. Um, uh, other issues that I've seen are, um, students who will say, you know, people stare at me at the gym when I do weight training, they expect, you know, women to be on the elliptical machine and not to do weight training with the guys. And, um, there are still, uh, plenty of examples where students are, uh, stereotyped, uh, racially about what they should be good at or what sport they should play. So we have a long way to go there. Um, and I, I don't have that many students say uh, that their plans are to go into coaching. Um, I think that uh, it would be great if we had more um, of, a, of a, a pipeline into coaching and administration uh, with a, a clear path to mentoring and um, I see also that there are also that there's very poignant attitudes that I I'm entrusted with from the men as well. And one of the most moving conversations I ever had when I taught at Georgetown was a young man who talked about the pressure he was under to be a star football player until his fourth traumatic brain injury when the family doctor said stop and he could finally quit. So I, I, I just want to make sure I point out sometime today that uh, one of the things we need to look at is how we've learned to look at the injuries to children that come from ambitious parents, uh, that sports are great, but in the hands of overly zealous uh, mentors and, and custodians of youth, uh, not just, you know, horrific cases of sexual abuse, but just being pushed until you're injured. Uh, that has not changed. Um, we now require bike helmets and knee pads, but I think we have a long way to go in terms of knowing when to stop pushing. Um, at the risk of uh, insulting any sport, I don't want to do that because uh, most of us were multi-sport athletes and we have friends who played in other sports besides basketball, obviously that went on to become our uh, favorite sport. Is there um, a, a sport or a certain area that you enjoy teaching more or that the kids enjoy hearing more about? And I wanna, I wanna talk about one area that resonated with me, obviously as an African-American and knowing the history of uh, a lot of the African-Americans. I mean, we know it in the men's sports, you know, that weren't allowed. Now, the Negro Leagues just recently got recognized by the uh, by Major League Baseball. And um, there are some African-American women now being recognized uh, for, for their contributions, like the Black Cherries, the women's basketball. I'm sure that every sport has mm -hmm. that. How do you bring that into to the to the fold and keep them receptive to it because I think sometimes they might think everybody started off at the same vantage point and that's just not the case. Well, it's very easy for me to answer those those great questions. Um, uh, I'm very passionate about teaching about the All American Girls Baseball League, uh, but I also am aware that the league was white only. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to talk about the imperfections in our history and our women's history and the need for both alliances and understanding and also uh, 
you know, being honest. Um, uh, I am an advocate for recognizing uh, Tony Stone and Mamie Peanut yes. Johnson. Uh, yes. And Mae uh, Tour and all of the women who played uh, either in, in uh, Olympic uh, ball, but also the, uh, the leagues in the 40s and 50s, um, and who played with men. Uh, welcome uh, neither in, you know, a, a, there was no women's profession and there was no place for them in white women's professional play. So I spent a whole lot, that's one of my exam questions on the All-American Girls Baseball League. Um, I enjoy that very much. Um, and I, I do have a, a family friend who's a, a, a umpire and a referee who comes in and talks about uh, some of the changes in, in women's softball. Um, I, I think mm -hmm. that for me, um, and the All-American the... Redheads in basketball, Bonnie, the All-American yes. Redheads were similar. Mm -hmm. And the Redheads, and I think what shocks my students is learning that, uh, you know, President Truman ordered the integration of the military in 1948. Uh, we had Jackie Robinson go into Major League Baseball in 1947, but the NBA was left. 1950, they did not admit a black player. So this assumption that there had always been black men in, in, in basketball, not, not in the professional level until really later. So I, I um, uh, yeah. talk about my own experiences uh, playing um, uh, youth soccer, but with a story that, that you know, the class enjoys, which I've told over and over is how I got out of jail in Borneo uh, by uh, pretending to be a professional mm -hmm. soccer player. And that's just a semester at sea experience where I, like a lot of people, was you know d detained at an airport uh, in uh, Malaysia on, on suspicion of, you know, who are you and what are you doing with these students? I had just visited a tribal longhouse and I had a, a blowpipe and blow darts that were a gift from the chief. I had hit the bullseye and, and had been honored. And interestingly, I had been granted uh, status as an honorary man for my athleticism. So I'm brimful of these presents, and but I'm not dressed very formally, and I'm stopped at airport security. And the airport security guard was like, what are you doing? Who are you? Are you some kind of drug trafficker? And I was like, no, sir, I'm here with semester at sea, and these are my students, and we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at your beautiful national culture. Uh, and... Um, uh, once I had established my bona fides, uh, this guy said, uh, if you really love our country, will you root for Malaysia in the World Cup? And I said, well, you bet. And I said, you know, I'm a former soccer player myself. And that's when he made his fatal mistake and said, women don't play soccer. And I pulled a grapefruit or a coconut out of my backpack and bounced it off my knee a few times. And he said, oh, you must be on the American women's national team. I was like, that's right. And I got a plane to catch. He was like, okay, you can go. And you know, your passport gets stamped. Ah. And the, the point I make in the book, the story's in the book, and it really happened. And the students love when I bring in the blowpipe. And um, this is about that soccer or sports, it's an international language. If you can communicate in a friendly way, look what it will do for you. Uh, it will break down what could be a very scary situation. Um, it is a, a fact of international brotherhood that men can talk about sports in any language and have a moment of kinship and women are really late to that right. Um, but if it is part of your skill set, um, and I came late to it myself, it has opened up uh, many doors and it's enabled me to be a better global ambassador. So I emphasize everything I can think of in the, in the course of the semester we look at basketball, soccer, baseball, softball, track. I, I feel bad I don't do uh, enough lacrosse uh, or let's say yoga. Um, and I'm always apologizing, but depending on who I know is enrolled, I'll go out of my way to focus on the history of uh, the sport of whoever is in the third row and is, is very much participating. I had three Olympic swimmers and a tennis pro uh, in my most recent class. And then two years before I had a Dodger uh, and he was wonderful. And I've certainly started out with Alana Myers Taylor, Bob sled medalist in my class at George Washington University. Wow, just she went her. on to be head of the Women's Sports Foundation as well as an unbelievable uh, global star. 
I have two more questions and I know that, and I know we want to allow the participants you to answer some of their questions, but I have two more. Um, and um, I'm gonna read this one because it says in a recent poll conducted by the Associated Press, uh, Nork Center and the National Women's History Museum, researchers found um, that though most respondents believe some progress had been made in providing equal treatment for women, men saw more progress toward achieving equal treatment for women, not surprising, with 61% saying a great deal or a lot has been made, comparing to only 37% who felt that way. Have you seen similar sentiments in your class, particularly around women and girls treatment in sports? And I let's not forget the Sedona Prince uh, blew the lid off the NCAA last year with the weight room controversy. And having uh, been a yeah. college coach, yeah, we know that we, we get caught up in thinking because we have more than we had, that it's equal, but it's not necessarily so. I think a big change in the in the 25 years I've been teaching has been the, the greater weight of the internet and cyber activism and the, the fact that we all saw the disparity in the weight room uh, facilities at that NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. That shocked a lot of people into seeing the material culture of inequality. Um, the, the fact that the poll skews with men thinking there has been more progress made than women, uh, much of what's happened is that Title IX has opened the door for women to achieve in academics and professionally, and we have more women than ever before in the workforce and the public sphere, and more women than ever before reporting inequality, sexual harassment, and wage suppression. So uh, we have a critical mass of successful women who deal with uncomfortable conditions uh, and who are more comfortable, Democrat and Republican, according to the poll, speaking up about that. Um, the other, uh, I think, big change is that there has been less of a stigma in speaking up about sexual abuse and sexual harassment. So there's more reporting and more uh, comfort in coming forward, but I, I think that all along, there's been a very high incidence of that. Uh, and it's interesting to me that because guys have spoken up about uh, sexual abuse in sport at Ohio State, Penn State, and beyond, uh, that it's made it uh, more acceptable for women to talk about it. Um, that is an interesting pattern. Um, but I also believe that um, uh, where more men think, you know, hey, there's been so much progress made, it's because they're seeing around them women in positions of authority. And the big issue is we have a cultural lag in really accepting that and in accepting uh, men taking direction from women. So we need to step up having women officiate men's games and women uh, in positions as athletic directors. Um, and that's the real question. Uh, I also think we need to see more television commercials that show women coaching boys or moms having a catch with daughters, you know, uh, all of that is, is so easy uh, to help uh, improve things. And it's something we just don't see in the same way that we don't see enough advertisement of women's games when that's one of the most cost-effective ways of evening the playing field. Um, at this time, and I will defer to Emma and I can continue with questions, but I do see uh, some questions in the Q and A Q, and I just want to just check Emma if we should go there with uh, with uh, less than fifteen minutes left, or if I should proceed. I just want to see if we're going to get to some of the the participants' questions. Uh, Liz, you are welcome to ask that final question, and then we've got some great questions coming in in the Q and A. Okay, I just want to say that uh, I would love to, and it's more of a comment. Um, and timelines are important. We do timelines. We believe, believe timelines will bring to light what is omitted or what may need to be inserted. And so I, I love that because I think it serves as a reference guide, as a resource, and like we like to say, as a touchstone for the young women. So they can look back and realize that they do. When, when, and I would say to the participants, when you're looking for history, 
realize that we were there, women were there. And it just takes a little bit of research to find that there was somebody that looked like you that, that paved the way and how important it is to know whose shoulders you stand on. And I think um, Bonnie does a great job of that in her book and just as much as humanly possible to let people know that these were the women whose shoulders and men we have we can't count yeah, out there were also men who we have great male champions for women's sports so um it's more of a statement than anything and you can comment if you like but i just i just think that's a great approach to it and it's just an ever-evolving tool to to tell the history to be more inclusive and to um share that history and pass it on to to the generations uh, of today thank you so much Who's got a question? Okay. okay. Hi. Yeah. So we've got some amazing questions coming in in the chat. So uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone. And thank you again, Liz and Bonnie. This has been a wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions that came in is kind of tied to um, your last comment, Liz, but uh, someone said in the fall, I'll be teaching a college course called American Sports History. Do you have any thoughts on how a sports history course that doesn't focus exclusively on women could be fair in its coverage of women's sports? Sure. Um, and thanks. Um, somebody just asked, uh, do I uh, use the work of Michael Messner? Yes. Uh, I'm also in touch with um, a man who's teaching uh, one of the first uh, uh, women's sports history classes at the high school level in South Dakota, Trent Delugash, uh, and he's been wonderful. I, I guess spoke in his class online. Um, the class I teach at Berkeley is actually called uh, Sport and Gender in U.S. History. It's not only uh, women's sports. Um, so uh, it's actually a pretty even model. Um, obviously, I emphasize uh, the role of women because it's the issue of our day. Um, I think there's lots of ways that we can look at the struggle that men have experienced in this country, uh, primarily due to Jim Crow law and segregation, uh, and also the experiences of, of men in other communities, Latino, uh, Asian, Native American, Arab. Um, I think that there's lots of ways that you can teach a course that doesn't simply put, oh, now we're gonna look at women today into one class, but introduces different stories each, each session. Um, and if you do that, it'll, it will appear natural, uh, which it is. Um, there is a whole genre now of great sports writing. Um, and there's also a lot of women uh, journalists who have looked at both men and women in sports, Christine Brennan, uh, my personal favorite, uh, and they're incredible resources for women as sports journalists writing about men, that that should also be a matter of fact. Um, you don't only have to focus on women if, if you are female. Uh, all of those are aspects I hope would give some comfort to anybody who's planning a class, but you know, email me and let's chat and anybody can write to me and uh, find me online. Uh, I'm sure my website is in the chat somewhere and I, I can take other questions later. What was the other question? Uh, that was that was just a question. So thank okay. you for that. And then another question came in actually, Liz, for you. Um, someone wants to know about your recent trip to Knoxville and what made this trip so remarkable. Well, in 2018, we were inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of, Hall of Fame, we meaning the WBL, the first women's professional basketball league in the United States, as trailblazers of the game. Since then, we've been going, I'll try, try to make this quick. Since then, we've been going back every year. Well, our coach, Doug Bruno, uh, who fought so hard for us, he's still the current women's basketball coach at DePaul University. And uh, he fought so hard for our league to get inducted. He was being inducted and we wanted to go back and support him. The other thing that made it special was we were able to upgrade our web, our display, which really broadened the history and contributions of the women of the triad, the, the AIAW, Title IX and the WBL. And um, there was a debut for that. So in a nutshell, that's that's very exciting. 
All right, so we have so many wonderful questions, but I think we can probably get one more in here. Um, so I guess the, the kind of the final question, if I can sum it up and, and you know, Bonnie and Liz, you've both addressed this um, in various ways, but why do you think it's so important to teach women's sports history? There is no better platform for addressing all of the issues in feminism, but also all of the complications in American history. Through sports, you can look at uh, racial conflict, legalized segregation of play spaces, the way children are introduced to ideals of fairness in this country. Uh, it allows for looking at masculinity and femininity in our clothing, our language, our toys, uh, our games. Um, it looks at the hidden legacies of bias in the use of mascot names uh, for teams and the ways that people are reversing some of these insulting trends today, which is, gives me great hope. Uh, it's a way that we can look at uh, the pleasure of achievement and competition and also some of the excesses, the way that the sort of nation state functions to where we use the Olympics to act out our rivalries with different enemies each time and the pressure that puts on athletes to sort of represent a national body. Uh, I look at the so-called Nazi Olympics of 1936 and the plight of Jewish athletes. Um, I look at, um, uh, but somebody else could also look at more specifically sports marketing, sports as a business. Uh, who makes our sneakers? Let's talk about it. Uh, and what are the conditions in those sweatshops overseas? I took my students to some places with semester at sea. So um, whatever a person's, my intention is whatever a student's major, there should be something for them, whether it's social justice, uh, English history, gender studies, the uh, anything that allows a student to produce a paper that could be publishable or get them into law school later on. Actually, a sports history class is enabling students to succeed in their chosen fields. Um, it does introduce everyone to the heroines I'd like to make known and to uh, film directors, uh, video, the you know range of photography, all of those aspects. I've had students say that the class inspired them to work through their engineering major to design prosthetics for students going to the, for athletes going to the Paralympics. So there is a connection for every major. Um, and I get tons of mail from students who have graduated saying how much they miss having a forum to talk about these issues how tough it is out there in the real working world. And it always ends with, Dr. Morris, did you see this article? So uh, people find it relevant uh, day after day, and they do share with me later on, which has forged many a warm relationship I appreciate so deeply. Uh, Liz, would you like to answer that yes. question as well? Yes, um, I think, uh, and we don't always want to pat on ourselves after the men, but they do get it right. And I'm speaking in women's basketball and probably all male sports. They honor and revere the four. They get farther and uh, they, they, they make sure that they are cemented on that timeline. So we are often seeing how far the game has come. And I forgive me if I continue to speak about basketball, but it could be tennis or soccer or any. Oh, the game has come a long way. Well, for women, how can we truly judge how far it's come when we don't know where it began? Those seminal moments, key moments. We don't do that. And because we don't do that, you have WNBA players, I'm gonna use as an example, who started the league, we're celebrating 26 years, and the kids today don't know who they are. So when you, when you don't go back and remember and recount the, this history, then this new group, every group becomes the new forgotten. We don't mm -hmm. remember, a lot of kids don't remember who Cheryl Swoops was. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't remember the players that started the WNBA, those who were 10 years in. So I think history and studying the history of women in sports is crucial in order to use as a reference, which I mentioned earlier, as a guide, as a touchstone, and to truly gauge how far we have come and, and then inevitably how far we still need to go. 
And I'm happy to send my syllabus to anybody who would who would like to learn more. Uh, and uh, I am deeply grateful to the National Women's History Museum for allowing me to introduce my brand new book through this forum and for help, help really, you know, letting me be a scholarly advisor to the museum for all these years. What an honor. Uh, and likewise, I would just like to say, and I, I want to end on a high note, but uh, I just kept seeing a comment that said, this was supposed to be about women's history and they may not have felt that it was, but um, I certainly, I, I don't want to speak for Bonnie, she just spoke for herself. And I will open that up for myself in as much as I can speak about the history that I know, which is women's basketball, but I also know about other women's sports history. If there's anything you would feel that we could help you, uh, please feel free to answer, uh, ask us any questions questions as well. I did feel that we covered a lot of history, other topics, but we certainly want everyone to come away feeling that they got what they wanted to get out of this. And so we will definitely open our open ourselves up to um, to any questions you might have that will answer your questions. So again, thank you. Thank you both so much. And, and there are many people in the chat who are saying how wonderful this was and they appreciate it and definitely share your syllabus, Bonnie. Um, so I want to thank you both again, Bonnie and Liz, and for all of you who joined us online for, for coming and listening to us this evening. It's our great pleasure to spend this Thursday night in conversation with inspiring guests in our museum community. If you enjoyed today's program, then please mark June 26th, this Sunday on your calendars, when the museum will also be commemorating 50 years of Title IX with a special Sundays at Home at our normal gathering time of 3 p.m. Eastern. Emily Martin will moderate a conversation between Dr. Judy Wu and Gwendolyn Mink about one of the fierce and fearless women who fought for the passage of Title IX, Congresswoman Patsy Takamato Mink. Gwendolyn Mink is the late Congresswoman's daughter. For a full listing of upcoming programs and for registration information, please visit the Public Programs and Events tab at www.womenshistory.org. All events are free, but advanced registration is required. So again, thank you so much, Bonnie and Liz. I loved listening to this conversation. Thank you for sharing your time and your insights. And until next time we meet, please stay safe and healthy. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today.